And again, we are now moving forward in our topic eight ecology chapter that we have here. Now, in this part two video of ecology, we're going to be talking about um, characteristic biotic and abiotic components of a terrestrial ecosystem. Now, the key term that we're looking at here is terrestrial. And terrestrial just simply means that it is on land. Okay, so this could be at the highest mountain or the deepest valley. But what we're looking at is uh, ecosystems, or another word for them is biomes that occur on a land of Earth. Now remember, we're looking at the living and non-living factors that make up an ecosystem. Again, we're looking at the biotic factors and the abiotic factors. Now if you remember from the last video, biotic factors are living things in an ecosystem like fungi or plants protist, animals, archaea, bacteria, things that show the eight characteristics of life. And we're also going to be looking at key abiotic factors, non-living things in the ecosystem like the air quality, the salinity or salt, the soil, water, light, temperature, minerals, pH, and humidity. So remember, abiotic is non-living and biotic are living factors of these ecosystems. So if we look here, we want to be able to identify some of these biotic and abiotic factors. So let's start with our biotic factors and circle the biotic factors in red. So if we take a look here, some of the things we have are soil organisms, things that are alive inside of that soil. We also have trees. We have birds right there. We have plants, rabbits, okay? Our biological community or our living things that we have inside of it, okay? There's more animals here. We got fish, okay? These are all biotic factors. Now, if we look at the abiotic factors, the non-living things, those are things like the sun, disturbances, moisture, um, if you look here, minerals, nutrients, these are non-living things that still have a key um, factor, a key thing in determining the ecosystem that they live in. Now, when we're talking about animals, we have to talk about, you know, who lives where. So each organism has a particular type of environment where it can survive. So this particular type of environment where animals survive is called their habitat. So Biomes have very characteristic organisms that live there. So habitats have a range of factors, these abiotic and biotic, that influence the community that lives there, temperature, precipitation. And all of these different characteristics determine the biome in which uh, we characterize it as. So some organisms have a single critical factor. And a critical factor is just a biotic or abiotic factor that plays the greatest role in determining its range or where it can live. So obviously a polar bear is not going to live in Florida because of those biotic and abiotic factors which allow it to survive. So when we talk about the critical fa factor, we like to think of this as the Goldilocks effect, meaning, you know, think about in Goldilocks, the bear's porridge. One was too hot, one was too cold, but one was just right. Now, when those critical factors is just right, that's when the population is going to be able to survive the best. So, <clears throat> when a population is right on its critical factor, when the right level of an environmental factor is present, population levels will grow or at their peak. We call this the optimal range. So, here's our optimal range. Notice Notice that this is where the population is the highest because that critical factor supports life the best. Now, as we move away from that critical factor on this environmental gradient, you'll notice that the factor now becomes a detriment because it's no longer the perfect place. So that would be the zone of physiological stress. This is when the levels of the factor are too high or too low and the population can barely survive. Now notice we have two of those. One where that critical factor is too high and one when it's too low. Now when that critical factor is way out of the extremes, like 
when it's way too cold or way too hot or way too high or way too low, we call that the zone of intolerance. This is when the population dies out. So think of it in terms of like an ecosystem. If you go too far, far north, it gets too cold. If you get too far south, it gets too warm. But in the middle is where it's just right where all those organisms can survive. Now, there are two very important abiotic factors that actually influence uh, ecosystems or biomes, and those are temperature and precipitation. So if we'll look here, here is the annual precipitation on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis, we have our um, average annual temperature. So notice when you have very little precipitation, very low temperature, you have a tundra. As you increase in temperature, you get to a Borel forest, then a woodland shrubland. So in other words, these two conditions actually contribute to what we have or what biome we have. So when we have high temperature, high precipitation, we have a tropical rainforest. Low temperature, low precipitation, a tundra. And you'll see all of these different um, biomes in between. But these are the two key abiotic factors that influence ecosystems. Now, another abiotic influence on the ecosystem is latitude. So latitude is just simply how north or south you are away from the equator. And as you move north and south from the equator, the temperature tends to drop. So if you look here, when you are close to the equator, like right here, what you get is a tropical rainforest because of the warm, um, wet conditions. As you increase in latitude, you get to a point where you are at high latitudes and you get yourself a tundra because of how cold it is in that location. And you can see the different variations in between. Altitude is another thing that actually affects it because altitude, the higher you go, the colder it will actually be. So altitude or elevation from the sea level increases, average temperature decreases as well. So again, if you are increasing, altitude, you are decreasing temperature. So that just kind of shows you where you are in these type of locations. So what we're going to be talking about here are the eight major terrestrial biomes that we have. And if you look at this map here, you notice that they are in pretty, you know, it, they're not like very sparse. They are big areas that take up the uh, world. So we're going to be talking about the tropical rainforest, which is located near the equator in this light green right here. Savannas, and savannas are like the African desert, okay? See that there, there. See they're just out off the equator. Chaparral forests, chaparral forests are located in California, as well as in the Mediterranean Sea. Temperate grasslands, that's where in Pennsylvania, okay, uh, in Europe, parts of Asia, and again, that those are characterized by the four seasons, again, moving away from the equator. Uh, temperate grasslands, again, those two locations right there. Burrell forests are distinguished by very far north. You see they can stretch all the way from Alaska through Russia. They're characterized by an evergreen tree. And then finally, you have the Arctic tundra. Very few plants, very cold, very little precipitation. So again, biomes are these large-scale environments that are distinguished by characteristic temperature ranges and the amount of precipitation, kind of like what we saw earlier there. These biomes are characterized by these two factors, and whatever um, percentage you get of both kind of determines what type of biome you have. So let's start with the first type of terrestrial biome, and that's a tropical rainforest. Now, a tropical rainforest receives the greatest amount of rainfall of any other biome and are constantly warm. So the thing about this is they have very few abiotic limiting factors because they have a high amount of rain. They are very warm. This is ideal for plants to grow. And again, these abiotic factors are not something that limits the growth or the amount of animals. Therefore, tropical rainforests are one of the most productive ecosystems that we have. So the next one we have are actually called savannas. These are tropical grasslands. In a savanna, you almost want to think of the Lion King, right? 
the Lion King, you have these few trees, grassy areas. Sometimes there's fires in the dry season, but sometimes there's more water than you know what to do with in the wet season. Now, savannas are located near the equator and are usually between deserts and rainforest biomes and have very scattered trees. Now, savannas have a very constant temperature, which means they have no seasons. The only seasons that they actually have in terms of uh, two different like characteristics are they have the rainy season, where life kind of explodes, and then they also have the dry season, where it's very characteristic by fires. So again, there's no seasons the terms that we think of, of like spring, fall, winter, summer. Not seasons characterized by temperature, but seasons characterized by when we get a lot of rainfall or no rainfall. So an example of this, obviously, oops, sorry about that. The example of this would be our African savanna or pretty much like our African grasslands. Think about when you see elephants and giraffes roaming through, that's what you want to think of. Now, our next one are deserts. Now, deserts are frequently located on what's known as the downwind or lee side of the mountain range, which means they get almost no rainfall. So it creates what's known as the rain shadow effect, which pretty much the rain falls on one side of the mountain and not the other. Well, where the rain doesn't fall is where the desert is located. Now, deserts are the lowest moisture levels of all ecosystems. Precipitation is infrequent and unpredictable, and this is the abiotic factor that influences it. So, the lack of water is a major limiting factor for plant growth. This is why the only things you really see here are ones that have adapted to the low water or storing water like cactuses. But you'll notice there's a lot of different spaces or there's a lot of open spaces between the desert animals. So the lack of plants in turn is a limiting factor for any other consumer or decomposer in this. Again, deserts are very dry. Okay, think of it like the dry, sandy, not much living things. So here's what I'm talking about with the leeward and the windward side. So what happens is the moisture is swept off the ocean and what happens is it hits a mountain range. So remember, as we go up, it gets cooler. So as the air gets cooler, it can't hold as much moisture and the rain falls on the one side of the mountain. As it gets over the mountain, it comes over and warms. Well, now there's no moisture there and this is where the deserts are usually located because no rainfall. Now, another type of dry area, this is more like a savanna, but um, it's not quite the same thing because of its location, is a chaparral. Now, a chaparral is also called a scrub forest because there's really no trees. It's characterized by these low-lying um, bushes. And this is found in California and Australia. So what we know about these two locations is that in the dry months, these chaparral forests are very susceptible to fire. So the annual rainfall in this biome is around 65 to 75 centimeters, and the majority of the rainfall occurs in the winter. So again, these have a very short rainy season and a very long dry season. So again, summers are very dry, and mainly chaparral plants are dormant during the summertime because of no water and, and the hot, uh, high amount of heat. So the vegetation is dominated by shrubs and is adapted to periodic fires. Now those fires are very common and are actually very useful to these ecosystems. So what happens with these fires is as it burns through, now think about the forest fires that occurred in California a few years ago. But what happens is when these fires go through, they actually allow new plants to bloom. So the fires are actually beneficial to the ecosystem, not so much the people that live here because of their million dollar and, you know, houses getting burned down and that. Now, one that you probably are familiar with in the United States are temperate grasslands. Now, we call these prairies in the United States, and they are rather far away from the equator, equator and experience seasonal temperature shifts. Now, the thing about 
temperate grasslands is they actually get very lit limited amount of water, which is why we don't see trees. But the reason that the Midwest or the Great Plains is able to grow so much crops is because there's a giant aquifer underneath the ground that actually allows them to irrigate those crops. Now, prairie plants are also very adapted to two things, the cold winters, as well as frequent um, absence of precipitation. So what happens is, if you'll notice here, these prairie plants have extremely deep roots so that they can get water from deep down into the ground. So this enables prairie plants to do two things. One, survive extremely dry, extremely cold winters, and also recover very quickly from drought or wildfire. So trees cannot actually recover from this, but because the roots are so deep, they're not affected as much from these continuing things. Why you see a lot of grasses and not a lot of trees. Now the one that is very near and dear to me is the temperate deciduous forest. Okay, This is the forest of Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, and these are located at higher latitudes, experience a winter that reach below freezing. So this is actually why the plants lose their leaves. Like rainforests, most, uh, these mostly contain broadleaf trees, which are just simply big leaf trees unlike like pine trees, which are like needles. And they are well suited to absorb sunlight. So a lot of photosynthesis occurs in here. Now the growth is not constant. So the soil is actually much deeper and thicker, also because of all the falling leaves that actually decompose during the fall time. So these forests are distinguished by four distinct seasons of the climate, winter, fall, spring, and summer. Now, winter poses a big problem for these trees because the air in the wintertime is very dry. So what happens is these trees actually survive by losing their leaves. Deciduous trees adapt by shedding leaves when water is scarce or the ground is frozen. So they lay dormant during the winter. In the springtime, they regrow their leaves. And in the summertime, they're able to perform photosynthesis. Now another type of forest we have is the Borel forest. Now the Borel forest, also called the Taiga, are found throughout the northern latitudes, sometimes called the spruce moose belt. Now the spruce moose belt, why we call it that, is because they are evergreen trees. In other words, trees that never lose their leaves. Now these evergreen trees are very well adapted to long, cold, dry winters. So coniferous, uh, coniferous trees or coned trees producing trees are really well suited to live in this area so why we see all these pine trees now again the needle shaped leaves have a waxy coating that retains moisture in the winter which means they don't have to lose their leaves the cone shape of the actual tree allows accumulated snow to slide right to the ground so that the piling up of snow doesn't just break them now as we got further and for, further north, notice it got colder and colder. So colder and colder, excuse me. So last one we have are polar grasslands, also called tundra. And the tundra are below freezing most of the year. So this is the limiting factor or the abiotic factor that controls the tundra. So due to the very short growing season, only the top layer of soil actually thaws and can support plant life. The rest of it is permanently frozen, which is why we call it permafrost. So the Alaskan tundra, the uh, Russian tundra, these are areas that never get warm enough to uh, thaw out all of it. Therefore, no trees, only very few shrubby plants. It cannot support a very large growing season. So there is a growing season in the tundra, but like I said, it's extremely short. So lichens, herbs, other small plants, they survive. Notice here, no trees, just these small shrubby brushes. Again, not conducive to supporting a lot of animals or life. Now, a really cool thing that's actually, I guess, cool or not cool thing, but in these locations, the permafrost is actually beginning to melt, which is causing a few, a lot of, actually a lot of environmental problems. So what you'll notice is when that permafrost melts, and you can actually see that permafrost there, that layer of permanently frozen. What's happening is it's actually releasing a lot of um, uh, nitrogen gas. It's releasing a lot of sulfur gas, but also it's revealing woolly mammoth tusks and 
bones of animals of the last, last ice age. And people are actually harvesting those and it's become a big industry. But again, that permafrost was once permanently frozen. Now because of global climate change, it's starting to thaw that and we're starting to see more and more collapses of that. So this is a brief overview of the terrestrial biomes that we have around the world. Hopefully this helps you out. Again, this is part two 